Thank you, ladies. Uh, be in prayer for Brother Pete. I got a text that he's uh, supposed to be on his way back from Texas, and there was a tornado, and then his plane caught on fire. So I think that's. Uh, I think he's okay. I, yeah, Pete probably started it. No. <laughs> um, so I don't know what's going on there. I don't want to alarm anybody. I think it's okay. I don't think it's a major deal. But he's uh, not going to be here this Sunday. Uh, just some jokes here. Some one-liners. When you choke a Smurf, what color does it turn? I saw six men kicking and punching the mother-in-law. My neighbor said, are you going to help? I said, no, six should be enough. <laughs> the trouble with being punctual is that nobody's there to appreciate it. My wife's, <laughs> my wife's glaring at me after the last one. I have a wonderful mother-in-law. I'd like to put that on the internet there. She's, she's wonderful. I'm very blessed. Um, a fine is a tax for doing wrong. A tax is a fine for doing well. The trouble, think about that for a while. The trouble with doing something right the first time is that nobody appreciates how difficult it was. Funny how a dollar can look so big when you take it to church and so small when you take it to the store. The last one, a computer once beat me at chess, but it was no match for me at kickboxing. <laughs> okay, we'll pray and then get started here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, dear Lord. We, uh, we just thank you for your blessings. We pray that you'd watch over Pete as he tries to get home and uh, just keep him safe and, and uh, just bless the services today. We pray in your name. Amen. Uh, I'm going to do a little review. We're, we're doing a series on the uh, chemistry of separation. And uh, we looked at, um, I'm going to ask some questions here. Holy plus unholy always equals? Unholy. Very good. If we put something... If we put somebody that's sick with the healthy uh, people, the healthy people aren't going to make the sick person better. The sick person's going to make the healthy sick. And that's just a, a principle. We looked at some of the verses involved, and uh, we looked at some examples, Samson, Solomon, and um, they were they, spiritual people, and they got around the wrong people, and they didn't change them. They were changed, and they became unspiritual. That's why we have to have um, separation. Uh, I said exposure breeds acceptance. Whatever we're exposed to, we're going to eventually accept it. Think about a time in your life when you first saw something and it shocked you, and then you keep seeing it over and over again, and it no longer, you don't even think twice about it. Why? Because you've accepted it. And uh, we need to be careful about that. Uh, we need to be separate. If somebody's sinking in quicksand, do we just jump in there with them? What's going to happen? We're going to sink too, aren't we? Um, you get on solid ground and then you uh, fish them out. Uh, we talked about the uh, doing God's will comes first and knowing the doctrine follows. Uh, John 7:17 7, says, "If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine." The Bible says that we need to do His commandments, then we'll have understanding, we'll follow. Uh, we realize that everybody has standards, some form of separation, whether it's uh, the rich with the rich, the poor with the poor. You know, even kids separate according to age, political, uh, religious views. Everybody uh, separates. Even the criminals separate, don't they? Okay, they don't hang around with church people or they don't hang, hang around with the police. Okay, they, they, they practice separation. It's the Christians that, you know, we don't really have this thing down. We, we're not as separated as we should be. And, and, and I mentioned this before, that doesn't mean we just go into a monastery and become hermits and not witness to the world or become Amish. We need to reach the world, but it's who we're fellowshipping, who we're spending our time with. We need to be careful of that. Um, I looked at, we looked at uh, Psalms 37, 20 says, depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. And there's two parts here. It's not only depart from evil, but what's the second part? Do good. We're supposed to fill that with something. We're supposed to do right. And um, we're departing from evil so that we can do good. And uh, I, I mentioned that we need to go, a lot of times we're wandering around in the wilderness. We've come out of Egypt, we're wandering around the wilderness. We've never experienced Canaan. We've never really experienced the blessings of God. And what's going to happen if we're there? We're going to look back at Egypt and think, man, Egypt looks so good. That's what the Israelites did. They, never, they weren't where they were supposed to be. They, they weren't in the promised land and, and all the blessings of God. 
And once you've experienced that, you don't want to go back to the world. Once you're in Canaan land, once you're in the promised land, you don't want to go back to the world. The world has nothing there. But if you're wandering in the wilderness, you're going to start looking back and, you know, and we get a distorted view of what it used to be like, didn't they? I mean, they are in slavery. I don't know any slave that would say, hey, I, I liked it better in slavery. You know, they got a twisted view of the world, and that's what we get. We forget about all the bad things and, and look back at, you know, look at back at it with the wrong perspective. We talked about we need separation from temptation. We're not only supposed to separate from sin, but from temptation itself. And sometimes we think, oh, I'm going to get as close as I possibly can, and I'm not, I'm not actually sinning. I'm going to get to the line here, and, and I'm going to be right here, and I haven't crossed the line yet. I, I'm good, but why get so close? We need to separate from the temptation and uh, stay as far as we can. I mentioned the wagon driver. You know, a guy wanted to hire a wagon driver, so the first one goes over the cliff and gets one wheel over the cliff and says, look how good of a driver I am. The second one gets two wheels over and says, man, I'm an even better driver. The third one stays as far away from the cliff as possible. And the guy hired the third one. Why? Because we shouldn't be seeing how far close to the cliff we can go without falling off. Um, you don't, if you don't control what you can't control, things will get out of control. Okay, you cannot live in temptation and avoid sin. Okay, you cannot be constantly avoiding, uh, live in temptation and not avoid sin. You're going to fall in eventually. And uh, we need to be careful. Um, you become what you expose yourself to. And um, we looked at Lot. He, he started looking towards Sodom. We looked at Eve. She was looking at the fruit. Um, Eve saw that the tree was good for food. She's looking at it. Why is she looking at it? She does, she's got every other tree in the whole world to, to eat from. She's got to look at the one thing she can't. It's temptation. And you can say, well, I'm not sinning. I haven't eaten of it yet. But you look at it long enough, but you're eventually going to take it, and that's what she did. And um, if God says we're not supposed to have it, we shouldn't even be looking at it, right? Uh, we looked at Achan and Solomon, and uh, just some examples. We need to be careful. You know, uh, everybody experiences peer pressure. You know, I feel bad for teens. They go have a lot of peer pressure when they're teenagers. And uh, we can't... Um, can't decide whether or not they experience peer pressure, but we can decide who our peers are, right? Okay? They say, oh, yeah, you know, I, I was pressured into it. Well, why are you even hanging around those people to begin with? You know, you know they're not doing good. You know they're not doing right. You can control. You can't control that they're pressuring you, but you can control that you're hanging around them. That's something you can control. Control what you can. And uh, don't just separate from sin. Separate from temptation itself. Today we're looking at uh, walls and gates. Turn to uh, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3. It says, And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And we see here uh, in the context, they've rebuilt the temple, but they're without walls. They have nothing to protect the temple and the city. They're vulnerable. They're, de they're defenseless. And when we look at separation, it's a wall of protection that God wants us to build around our life. Um, and around our relationships with him. We need to have these walls. We need to protect what's inside. And uh, where there's no wall, there's going to be affliction and reproach in our lives, the lives of God's people. And uh, people seek liberty by destroying the walls that protect their liberty. And uh, you see teenagers, they are in the castle. They're being protected. What do they want to do? They want to get out. They want to destroy those, tear those walls down, tear the rules down, get out and do what they want, and those, they don't realize that they're not in captivity, they're, they're protecting them, they're, they're giving them freedom, they're giving them liberty, the walls. I, um, years ago, there's, there's a story, it's called Stay in the Castle, and I mean, you may have read it, and it's about a, a, a king, and he's got a, he's got a castle, and he reads from the book, and it's, it represents the Word of God, and he's got a daughter, and he keeps telling her that, you know, I got, I got somebody prepared for you. You know, you just got to stay in the castle. 
and he's going to come one day. And she's waiting and waiting and waiting, and she meets a, a, a young man who comes in. She can hear the, the noise of the city and the partying, and, and um, you know, the young delivery boy you know, starts talking to her and starts telling her what a great time they're having, and we're having a party, and you're missing out. You know? And she starts to think, hey, I'm, I'm missing out. I, I don't want to wait anymore. And she goes out with this guy and starts partying. She sneaks off, and she ends up uh, marrying this guy. And, and um, they end up you know, living in a, in, a, in a little shack and you know, dirt floors. And one day, she looks out the window, and she sees the prince that her dad had planned for her going to the castle, and she's not there. And uh, that <coughs> it's a sad story, but that's so true. P- p- kids, young people think, wow, the world's better. You know, my parents are keeping me. And uh, that's really the difference between first and second generation Christians. We have a lot of first generation, a lot of second generation, but the first generation have, have seen what the world has to offer. We got people here who spend all their paychecks on drugs and alcohol. And uh, Pastor Burke, um, he, he was preaching. He said he used to be a, a, the lead singer in a heavy metal band. <laughs> and I laughed. And he goes, I had long hair, and I just can't picture Pastor Burke, you know, you know doing a heavy metal band. But... Um, but he realizes what the world is and what's going on. So, you know, he's going to try to protect his children. He realizes how wicked and how, where that um, music leads and, and what it does to you. He's seen that lifestyle, so he's trying to protect his children. But what do the children think? They don't realize how bad it is and, and what's going on and how miserable it is out there. They see, well, I'm missing out. And the world makes it look so good. They got these ads and, you know, they beer and you know everybody's having a wonderful time you know they don't show the other side or the day after or you know all the you know uh, side effects that that wouldn't make great uh, ads that you know not too many people would buy alcohol with uh, if they saw what really happened you know and I know they, they try to show some of that side some different people but you know the kids don't see that so they they think well I'm just being kept in this castle and my, my parents don't love me and they're mean and they're keeping me within these walls, and they want to try to get out. Don't wait until you have kids before you put up walls of restriction. You know, get those walls built. Um, Look at Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. Nehemiah 4, verse 1. But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they receive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. And what, what, what is the world going to do? They're going to scoff at your standards. They're going to say, you know, they don't mean it. It won't last. I can't believe you. Don't let your kids do this. You know, you don't let your kids watch TV. You're such a, me. who does that? I mean, you got to be crazy to not let your kids watch, you know. They don't understand, and they, they scoff at it. We see here Sam Ballot and Tobiah, they're making fun. You know, a fox is going to knock it down. You know, it's, you're, you're nothing. It's not going to last. You're not going to make it. Why are you doing it? Look in verse 6. It says, So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto half thereof. For the people had to mind a mind to work. And uh, walls have to be built. They just don't appear. It's hard work to establish and maintain standards. And uh, anybody that's done construction, you know, people worked on this building. It, it was, it's a lot of work to build something. And uh, it's easy to tear something down, but it's very hard to... Uh, build something. I, I know some of you went to England and Scotland and you saw some of those castles. Can you imagine hauling those stones and, and building those castles with the technology that they had? I mean, that, that's an incredible amount of work to build those walls. And it's going to be work. Look in uh, Nehemiah 13, 22. You can shut it off, George. Okay. Pray for me. I'm not feeling it. Trying to get over a cold. Okay, Nehemiah 13.22 says, And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me. 
So we have walls, but any castle needs what? Gates, needs doors. You need to be able to get in and out. You know, it would be kind of a bad castle if you couldn't get in and out. You know, you'd starve eventually. So we need people to watch the gates. We need pastors, husbands, parents, teachers. Uh, we need leaders. We need people in authority to watch those gates, to help the children, to watch what comes in and, and what goes out. And, and uh, that's an important thing. I, uh, I was talking about guys here about Pastor Crowe, and he said some things, and he talks about having authorities in, in, in uh, young people's lives. And he goes, the more you have, the better. You know, some people don't want to keep them out of everything, and, oh, they only all listen to me, and they only obey me. But the more people you have, the more authorities, the more people are watching out for your child, and, and the more the better. And we need good people to uh, lift them up, lift the authorities up. You know, it's sad to see parents tear down the authorities in their kids' lives, and those are the people that can help their kids. And eventually, if you tear down authority of others, what are, what are you going to do to yourself? You're going to tear down your own authority, aren't you? Okay? You tear down all their authorities, the pastor, the youth pastor, the school teachers. Well, they're, eventually, they're going to turn around. They're not going to listen to you, right? You know, I, you've taught me not to listen to authority. Why should I listen to you? And uh, we hurt ourselves. But the walls of protection, the standards, are only as good as the watchman. Okay? You can have the highest walls, but if somebody gets in through the door, then what's the point? And I... I, I I went to Fort Niagara, and you probably know better than me, but I, I think it was, um, they, they left the door, the, gate, the guy was sleeping or something, and they, the English got in there, the Americans were guarding it. Great for, you know, all these, these features, all these cannons, everything. And I, I think I, I went to the Canadian fort. I think they said they took American uniforms, and uh, that's how they got in. So I'm not sure exactly the story. But... Um, they got in through the gate. They, didn't, they went, went in at night and just got in there, and the, the Americans were uh, surrounded, and they, they didn't even see it coming. And you can have the biggest, you can have the best fort, the best walls, but if you're asleep at the gate and you just let somebody walk in, then it defeats the whole purpose. We need people watching. If we don't have walls, we are a reproach. If we have walls without gates, we become Pharisees, and we will destroy the opportunity to help anybody else. We need to have walls with restricted entrance, biblical restrictions. And that's important. And uh, turn to Ezra chapter 4, verse 1. The next point is we need to build the temple first. Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. It says, now I'm going to read to verse 4. It says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put also in writing, saying, Thus saith say Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem." which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts, besides the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. And uh, what was the first thing that God did is he sent Ezra back to build the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, we know that the temple was the place where the Jews came to worship, and that was the center of their uh, life. And uh, the first thing that we must have is a walk with Christ, walk with God. Before we have anything to protect, we've got to have something inside there, don't we? And uh, we see the first thing God did was raise up somebody to build the temple, to reestablish the place of worship, and then he sent Nehemiah along to rebuild the walls, right? George, <coughs> Shut that. Sorry. And uh, we look, when we look at the time, it's harder to rebuild the temple than the walls. It took 46 years to build the temple. 46 years. You thought this project was long a year. I thought this lasted forever. I was like, oh, a year of my life, you know. Or I was talking to somebody else at another church, and they had a building project, and we were sharing stories. It's like, yeah, you work all day, and you come work here. And I thought a year, that was a long time. But I can't imagine... 
46 years, that's your whole life that you're not only doing your job, but you're also rebuilding this temple. But it took 52 days to build the walls. What's easier to build? The walls. It's harder to build your, the temple or your place of worship. That's the important thing. That's the hardest thing to build. And there's three, three types of people I want to look at. And the first one is those that want to have a relationship with God but do not have the standards to protect themselves. Okay, There's genuine people, and they, they care about God. They love God. But they, have, they built a temple, but they built no walls. And they have nothing to protect that, that temple. And eventually the devil's just going to walk right in. You're making it easy for the devil. He's just got to walk right up, and he can destroy your temple. You need to be careful. And there's those that have walls or all kinds of standards, but don't have a temple. They brag about how big their walls are, and everybody, you know, they look good. I got these high walls. I got all these standards. I dress good. Look at me. I'm so on the ball. And if you went inside their walls, you'd find what? No temple. There's no relationship with God. And uh, what happens to their kids? They know their parents are hypocrites, right? Okay? And you wonder why these people with all these standards, and the first chance those kids get, they leave because their dad has all these standards, all these walls, and they know what's inside. You know, you can't see what's inside. They, they cover it. They protect it. They won't let you in. But these kids, they know what their parents are like when they're at home. And they think, this is hypocritical. I don't want anything to do with it. And people say, well, it must be their standards. They, they had too high a standard. You know, lower the standards. Were the standards the problem? The problem was they had no walk with God. I look at a brother Don Green, and he's probably got the highest standards of anybody he know. But what happened to all his kids? They're all serving God, most of them. A lot of them in the ministry, pastors. Okay, His high standards didn't turn them off. Why? Because they saw how holy he was. Okay, He wasn't a hypocrite. He isn't a hypocrite. He's for real. And he's trying to protect that relationship that he has. He has a, you know, getting up at 4.30 and praying and, and doing that. Those kids saw that. They saw there's something real and there's something worth protecting. And they went on to serve God. Don't blame the standards, but don't have all these standards if you don't have any temple to protect. And uh, the third one, th those who have neither temple nor walls, there's nothing in your life that you're worried about protecting you won't see it important to have any standards, okay? You have no walk with God. Why do I need to protect it? Why do I need to have any standards? There, you know, I've got nothing to protect. There's nothing precious there. And uh, some people only take care of, of what they should not do, but they never really put things in their lives that ought to be there. And we we'll look at the positive side of things. We need to fill it with good things. What was Adam and Eve? What was their primary purpose? Was it to work? No. Okay, God did give them work, was to build character and, and satisfaction. But what did he primarily create them to do? Anybody know? Walk with him, right? That was their job. Walk with him, to love him, to fellowship him. That's with him. That's why he created Adam and Eve. Now, um, the, the rules existed to protect their relationship with God, okay? That was the purpose. He knew that if they ate of the fruit, they would destroy that relationship. But it, it does no good if they don't eat of the fruit, but then they have no relationship, right? Okay, what's the point of that? Does that make sense? Their point is to love God. The point of the rules and the standards is to protect the relationship. But if there's no relationship, you know, what's the point? And uh, we, they, we see that there. The rule is important, but it's only important if I'm going to walk with God. I'm not going to walk with them anyway. The rule really doesn't serve a purpose. And I'm not saying, well, I'm not spiritual at the moment. I'm going to chuck all my standards. No, get spiritual. Get right. Get with God. Start building your, your temple. The, the devil wins either way. Okay? He doesn't care if you have stay high standards. As long as you're not, you don't have a fellowship with God. Okay? He doesn't care if you build a huge castle with great big walls and there's nothing inside no, no relationship with God he's like hey, I'm not even going to try to break those what's, what's the point of attacking that person there's no there's nothing inside for me to get at you know I know those kids aren't going to turn out right because they see their parents are hypocrites the devil's wins uh, the Christianity is not just the absence of evil it's the presence of God 
Okay, that should be our goal. We don't, shouldn't be just, well, I've got all the evil out of my house. Are you close to God? Are you where you should be? Do you love God? Are you trying to build that temple, that relationship? And uh, we don't need to build Fort Knox if there's no gold in it, right? Okay, that'd be pointless to spend all this money building this super secure uh, place and there, there's nothing in there, okay? That, if you, we laugh because that's kind of like, who, who would do that? But sometimes we do that. We build these standards because we want to, you know, appear like we got it on the ball. We're trying to impress everybody, and there's nothing inside. We have rules at school. We're, I'm the principal of school. My wife's a teacher. We have rules to help them learn, to help them study. Okay, that's the purpose. Okay, to make them concentrate, to pay attention, to do well. If they don't do good, what's, you know, what's the point? I'm not saying uh, no rules for anybody that's not doing good at school. You know, that's missing the point. But uh, look in Ezra chapter 6, verse 21. And the ch it says, And the children of Israel, which were come out again out of captivity, and all such as had separated themselves unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land, to seek the Lord God of Israel, did eat. Do you get that? They separated themselves. Why? To seek the Lord God of Israel, okay? They didn't separate themselves just so they could be separated and brag about how separated they are, okay? The purpose was to seek the Lord God of Israel. Um, I'm, I'm running out of time, but Proverbs, I'll just read this. Proverbs 37, 27, depart from evil and do nothing. It says, do good and dwell forevermore. God's trying to tell us, don't just, it's not just the absence of evil, it's we need to do right. 1 Corinthians 10.31 uh, says, Wherefore there ye eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And um, God didn't make me to build walls. God made me to walk with him. Okay, that's not our pr We need to have walls. They're important. But that's not my goal here is to just see how high, if I can have the highest walls in the church and look the best and have the highest standards and have n absolutely no walk with God. That's really defeats the purpose, doesn't it? My goal is to have a walk with God. We need a devotional life, and uh, we need to build that temple. And uh, like I said, don't, if you don't have that temple, don't just, you know, break all your walls down and say, well, I don't have anything. You know, go build the, the temple, okay? It's going to take time. It's not easy. It's going to be work. But once you have that temple, build up those walls and protection. They're going to keep that temple safe. Let's, uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, dear Lord. We pray that we would uh, be separated, dear Lord. Help us to be separated unto good, dear Lord, and to serve you and to love you and build our temple, dear Lord, and, and build strong walls and have people uh, watching those walls, dear Lord, and keep us safe. And uh, we ask this in your name. Amen. Okay, you are dismissed to 1105.